Acts 14 is where we're going to be spending our time today. You have probably, or at least most of you, if you have some kind of churchy background, have heard of Isaac Watts. Uh, Isaac Watts was uh, a great hymn writer, and he, f he published his first collection of hymns in the year 1707. So, a long time ago, Isaac Watts published his first collection of hymns. What's interesting about this collection of hymns and the ones that he would subsequently publish is the enduring quality that they've had. Because churches throughout the world, at least English-speaking churches, continue to sing many of the songs that Isaac Watts wrote some over 300 years later. We are still singing those songs. Our church sings some of those songs. One of those songs is going to be familiar to many of you. And that song is called, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Most of you are familiar with When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. But in the second verse of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, he penned these lyrics. Uh, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. What Watts was trying to communicate in that song that he wrote 300 years ago that we still sing today is that when we gaze at the cross of Christ, when we truly see the cross as it is and when we see Jesus as he is and when we realize how undeserving we are of the grace that God has shown us in Christ, then there is no room for boasting. The Bible would say it's excluded None of us can take any credit for the grace that we have received. None of us can boast because our lives have been changed by the grace that we've received. And so he just, he writes a prayer that we sing together. Forbid it, Lord, that any of us should boast in anything but the cross. Who gets the glory is a big part of the scripture text that we're going to be looking at today in Acts chapter 14. But let me bring us up to speed on where we left off last week. La last week, we left off in Acts chapter 13 with Paul and Barnabas running for their lives. Remember that? They've traveled to Antioch and Pisidia, and we spent the last two weeks studying the sermon that Paul preached in that synagogue. And lots of people put their faith in Christ, believe, both Jews and Gentiles. And Gentiles is just a Bible category for anybody that's not a Jew. So there are people, both Jews and Gentiles, that put their faith in Christ. Things seem to be going well well until the synagogue leaders get unhappy with them. The synagogue leaders begin to persecute uh, them, to pursue them, and so they have to basically run towards their, for their lives, and they run east towards a city called Iconium. When they arrive in Iconium, Luke tells us in verse 1 through 6 of chapter 14 that their strategy in Iconium is basically the same as their strategy in Antioch of Pisidia. They go to the synagogue first. And in the synagogue, they preach the good news about Jesus and Jesus as the fulfillment of all of God's saving promises in the Old Testament. And Luke, the author of Acts, tells us once again that many Jews and God-fearing Gentiles believe. But the synagogue leadership gets jealous again. Acts 13 makes it explicit that one of the reasons they go after Paul and Barnabas is because they get jealous. They get jealous of the influence that Paul and Barnabas have, that they are pulling what they think is a following away from them to Paul and Barnabas, when in actuality, Paul and Barnabas are trying to pull a following towards Jesus. But they get jealous. In Antioch, they get jealous in Iconium. And verse 2 tells us that they poisoned the minds of the whole city, the Gentiles outside the synagogue, against Paul and Barnabas. So, note the irony of that. We've talked a little bit uh, about how little Jews and Gentiles actually get along. They won't even eat a meal together. But now they find that any enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? <laughs> Somebody that I would not get along with under any other circumstances becomes my ally when we share a common enemy. And the common enemy is Paul and Barnabas, those who are preaching the gospel. 
But that doesn't stop Paul and Barnabas. Verse 3 says, They remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So in, fact, in spite of the fact that there is, there's opposition to them, not only in the synagogue, but at the city at large, in spite of the opposition, they continue to boldly preach the gospel. But the heat continues to be turned up. And the city becomes unsafe. And it becomes so unsafe that we see there in those first few verses that they uncover a plot to basically assassinate them. They want to take Paul and Barnabas out and they are going to stone them to death outside the city. And once again, we find that they have to run for their lives. And so this time, they flee south to the twin cities of Derby and Lystra. And the rest of Acts chapter 14, or most of the rest of Acts chapter 14, is about an experience that they have in Lystra. So we're going to pick up our reading now in Acts chapter 14 and verse 8. Here's what God's Word says in verses 8 through 10. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. So Paul and Barnabas are continuing to preach the gospel in Lystra, we know from verse 7. But the venue is different this time. Most of the time, Paul and Barnabas have been going to a synagogue. And so we don't know where they are, but we know where they aren't. They're not in a synagogue, and they're not speaking to a primarily Jewish audience. They're not speaking to an audience of people that would be familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. And in the process of preaching the gospel, Paul ends up healing this man who has been disabled from the day of his birth and is known for being disabled. There's a lot of parallels here between Peter's miracle that he works in Acts chapter 4. But he heals this man, and I think it's interesting that the little flavors of detail that Luke gives for us, because the man doesn't, when, when Paul calls this man to stand up, Luke tells us that he sprang up. Okay, so he doesn't tentatively stand to his feet to see if this is going to work or not. He just jumps up and starts walking. And of course, if there was somebody here at our church that had been disabled from the day of their birth, and we all knew about that, we would probably respond the way this crowd responded. The crowd goes wild. They can't believe what they've just seen. This is an amazing act. So let's pick up a reading now in verses 11 to 13. Acts 14, verses 11 to 13. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. So they, they do this amazing miracle, this act of God, and it is completely understood, misunderstood by the audience. Okay, it goes straight over their head, and rather than glorifying God for this act of grace shown to this man who's been disabled his entire life, they start to deify in some way Paul and Barnabas. They give glory to them. They identify Barnabas with Zeus, who would have been the chief deity in the Greek pantheon, the Greek collection of gods. Zeus was the top dog. And they identify Barnabas with Zeus, and they identify Paul with Hermes. Hermes was the messenger of the gods, and probably because uh, Paul is the chief speaker here, they identify him with Hermes. But it's interesting here because Luke makes it a point to tell us that they're, they're crying out and speaking in Lyconian. So they're speaking in a native dialect and it's very probable that Paul and Barnabas don't know at this point what they're saying. So you can imagine if I'm Paul and Barnabas, I'm, I'm seeing the response of the crowd and how excited they are and I'm tapping Barnabas and I'm saying, man, they are loving this. They are seeing the power of God. They know what's going on here. This is great. Like, Barnabas, we are bigger than Billy Graham right now. <laughs> but the people are preparing to sacrifice to them. <laughs> and that's when Paul and Barnabas realize that something has gone terribly wrong. 
So they immediately try to redirect the crowd and give the glory to God for this miracle that has just been accomplished. Look with me now at verse 14 of Acts chapter 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. So when Paul and Barnabas realize what's going on, they tear their garments, which is a typical Jewish response to blasphemy. They realize that they are being given the glory as if, as if the resources to heal and rescue people are something that they possess. And so they're very concerned immediately to say no to the crowd. No, we're, we're people who are made of the same stuff you are. We're people of, na of like nature as you. And they're redirecting the glory from them to the God whose power has changed this man's physical trial that he's going through. The people of Lystra needed to give God the glory for this act of grace. And so here's the main principle that I want us to see from our text this week. God's grace is given for God's glory. God's grace is given for God's glory. And in the remaining time, I want us to see three demonstrations of God's grace that are intended to bring Him glory. Three different ways, three different avenues through which God blesses the world and His people which are intended to give Him glory so that God forbid that any of us should boast. Here's the first one. God's common grace gives Him glory. God's common grace gives him glory. Let me give you, let, no, will you please give me a few minutes to explain what I mean by that. The way they talk to the crowds is here is different than the way they talk to most of the other crowds that we've seen throughout Acts. You notice that immediately in the things that he said. Paul's sermon in Acts 13, which we just spent two weeks studying, is explicitly rooted in the Old Testament, wasn't it? God, Paul explicitly quotes Old Testament promises to make the case to these Jewish and God-fearing Gentiles in the synagogue that all of God's saving promises have now been fulfilled in the person of Christ. And so he traces in, sp in specific redemptive history, the history of God's work through his chosen people Israel to bring a Messiah. That's what the method has been most of the time. But here, he's speaking to a Gentile audience who would not have been familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures. They would not have been familiar with what we know as the Old Testament. And so even though his response to them is rooted in the Old Testament, he's not explicitly quoting the Old Testament. And his starting point for them is not Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament promises, which they were likely to know nothing about, or Jesus as, as the one who fixes their failures to to keep the Mosaic law, which they were not familiar with as well, he starts at another point. He wants to address their fundamental beliefs and assumptions about the nature of God. In other words, he wants to start all the way at the beginning so that their worldview, their viewpoint, their perspective correctly under, is correctly understood theologically based on who God is. And so Paul calls them in verse 15 to turn from their misunderstanding of God and to a proper understanding of God. Well, what does a proper understanding of God entail? Well, there's three things here that he says about God that are foundational for their proper understanding of the gospel. 
And here's the first one. He says first that he is a living God. They're to turn away from all these vain things and to a living God. Now what's the implication there? The implication in him presenting a living God as that gods like Hermes and Zeus and the rest of their pagan practices are no gods at all. They're actually figments of their imagination. They're, they're made up. They're, they're God made in man's image rather than man being made in God's image. And so he says that they need a correct understanding of the real God, the true God, the only living God. He points out a second item. The second item is this. He is also the creator. He says, you've turned from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So when he says the heaven and the earth and the sea, he's giving the dimensions of the universe and talking about how God has filled everything that is. From the heavens to the earth to the sea, God has created all of it. God has not played a role in creation. God is not a part of the creation. God is not one of the creators. Everything that exists is the product of his creative act of speech. God is the one who brings things into existence. God did not take existing materials that existed outside of him and form them into what we have. Nothing existed until God chose to make. And he made using no materials. He made simply by speaking things into existence. Because everything, because he's the creator, everything that exists comes from him, exists for him, and is accountable to him. Those are the implications of God as the creator. If God is the creator, that means everything exists for him. We are not here to blaze our own way or live life our, on our own terms. Everything, uh, we are all accountable to him. And we exist to bring him glory. There's a third point he's going to make about God. Not only is he the true and living God, not only is he the creator, but he is the source of all blessings. In other words, every good thing that you can possibly experience on this earth ultimately comes from him. Every blessing. Verse 16, Paul tells them that in the past, God allowed the nations to walk in their own ways. Now what he's saying there is up until this point, the focus of God's redemptive work has been on his chosen people, Israel. And the Bible tells us that God did not choose to work with Israel because Israel was great. They were already halfway there. He did a survey of the nations and saw that these are the people that are most likely to be faithful to me. If you look at Israel's history, they faithless over and over again. So God didn't choose to work with them to, to, to bring a Messiah through this nation because of something inside of them. He simply chose that of his free will. But God, even in using them, had not left the nations without any sort of witness or testimony. He did all people good by sending rain Seasons of planting, fruitful harvest, food to eat, gladness. Every gift ultimately derives from him. Though God had in times past left the nations to go their own way, God had not left himself without representation, and his calling card is common grace. Common grace is common not in the sense that it is ordinary, run-of-the-mill, boring. It's common in the sense that it is available to everyone. Why do they call the common area of a university the common area? Because it's a place where all the students can gather. It's available to everyone. And that's the kind of grace that is available in all of these blessings. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. For he makes his son rise on the evil 
and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. All people everywhere, whether they submit to God or not, whether they acknowledge God as creator or not, whether they choose to pretend that he does not exist, doesn't, whether they choose to pretend whether he exists or not, whether they choose to decide that it's unknowable whether God exists or not, all people experience God's blessings. He's behind every good gift in this world. It is a gift of God every time we have the privilege of seeing the sky turn purple and yellow and orange and red when the sun sets. God is behind the rains that finally come when everybody is concerned about forest fires getting out of control and we're, we, you can't have any sort of fire on your property because everything is so dry. And when, he, when rain finally comes and soaks this thirsty ground, God is behind it. When you go to the beach and you feel the sun on your shoulders and you smell the salt in the air and you press your feet down into the, into the sand and you have that satisfied feeling where you just exhale, that's God. When you gather around the table with your family around the holidays and there's more food that you could, than you could possibly eat, God is behind that blessing. God is behind the joy that comes when you see a baby laugh. A living creator God blesses his creation every day. And Psalm 19, which was actually referenced this morning, Psalm 19 says that one thing and one thing only declare, uh, their creation declares one thing and one thing only. And do you know what that is? The thing that creation declares is not that we are lucky to be the random products of time and chance who happen to be lucky enough to see an eclipse which is itself the random product of time and chance. The heavens declare the glory of God. And every blessing that we receive, whether we acknowledge or, or not, whether we turn our nose at God or not, whether we pretend He exists or not, everything is ultimately from Him. He's left His calling card everywhere. But humanity does not give Him glory for every good gift like we should. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 21 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So here's the uncomfortable picture of humanity that the Bible paints. We have the audacity to breathe God's air and eat God's food and live in God's creation and enjoy uh, the blessings of vocation and family and people and play and the creation that he has put around us. And instead of honoring him and having thankful hearts, we worship the gifts and reject the giver. We worship the creation instead of the creator. And that's why there is a second demonstration of God's grace that's intended to bring him glory. And that second demonstration is God's uncommon grace. God's uncommon grace gives him glory. Paul and Barnabas told the crowd in verse 15 that they had brought good news 
And that good news was the message of the gospel that they had been faithfully preaching in Lystra, according to verse 7. They come to Lystra and they preach the good news of the gospel. The people of Lystra had embraced vain things. Vain things are empty things, useless things, futile things. And we as humans are always trying to cobble together an identity and a value system out of useless, empty things. Or the things themselves may not be useless, but we try to, to make more of those things than they ought to be. And they occupy more a place in our lives and hearts than they ought to occupy. The people at Lystra, as all humanity has done, have suppressed the truth that they did have about God. They'd worshipped the creature rather than the creator. And Romans, the passage that we read in Romans chapter 1, says that their, that behavior had earned God's wrath. But there's good news. Good news had been brought to these people. And the good news was that God would show grace to people who have spent a lifetime receiving God's blessings but rejecting the giver. This gospel grace is uncommon in the sense that it is a message that needs to be brought. It's a message that needs to be delivered. It's a message that a fallen, broken world desperately needs to hear. And that's why Paul, who said these words on this occasion, would later write in his epistle to the Romans in chapter, Romans 10, 14, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? You see, this uncommon message of grace has to be brought to people so that they can hear the good news of what Jesus has done to rescue them from all of these vain things and have them turn to a living God. The good news of the gospel is that God shows grace. Like he doesn't have to. That's what grace is. If God was obligated to rescue humanity, if God was obligated to do something for us, then it would no longer be grace, would it? It would be something that he has to do. I, I got these people into it. I've got to get them out. But God was under no obligation. He simply moves towards us through Christ in grace. And we receive that when we turn away from vain things to the true and living God. Now, we don't have time to explore this through Acts, and we've seen it already, but turning away is the language of repentance and faith. If, you, if you're interested, you can look up a couple verses later. Acts 3.19, and also chapter 11 and verse 21, draw those connections between turning, being associated with faith and repentance. All of humanity is called to repent of our sins and put our trust in Jesus. We're all called to turn away from these vain, empty things that we idolize. And of course, when Paul is speaking to his audience in this text, he's calling people to turn away from their false conception of gods to the one true and living God. We may not be called to turn away from the same thing. We obviously don't have any, I say obviously, we probably, the likelihood is high that we don't have any Zeus or Hermes followers here. But we are no less captivated by empty and vain things today. Our gods go by the name of wealth and power and sex and fame and pleasure and work and even family. We are just as liable for worshiping the creation rather than the creator. We are just as liable to love the gifts more than the giver. And it is an act of uncommon grace that God would rescue us from that. <laughs> 
that he would turn us away from the empty and futile path on which we walk and turn him towards himself at the cost of the sacrifice of his own son. These people in Lystra had experienced the uncommon grace of God's blessings that he gives to all people everywhere. They had experienced, I think I said the wrong thing, common grace. That he, they experienced the common grace of God's blessings to all people, the uncommon grace of the gospel. And yet, that last verse we saw in verse 18 says, still, with all of that explanation, they could scarcely keep the people from sacrificing to them. Which is why there is a third demonstration of God's grace intended to bring him glory. And here is that third demonstration of God's grace. God's sovereign grace gives him glory. God's sovereign grace gives him glory. The witness of God that's everywhere for everyone to see does not often result in humanity glorifying him as they should. And so whenever a person does turn away from these vain things to a true and living God, God is the one who is sovereignly in, at work in them to do so. That's one of the points that, that, the, uh, that Luke, the author of Acts, has been making throughout this book. One of the things that Luke takes great care to show is that everything that has been happening in human history and redemptive history, even in the very sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, is God's intentional plan. When it seemed, even on the darkest day, that Christ had been crucified and rejected by the people who ca he came to save, their understanding of that was not that things had gone desperately out of control. God had been in charge the whole time. And the fact that people understand the sovereignty of God is why the believers would pray in Acts 4.24. They would address the sovereign Lord who made everything and ask him to give them to speak the gospel. Why would they address the sovereign Lord and ask him to, give, him to give them boldness? Because they understood that they are ineffective without his work. There's nothing that we can actually do to convince a person to come to faith in Christ. There's no key that we have to find that, that unlocks a person's heart. The only person who can turn, the only the person that can turn a person from, from darkness to light is God. The same sovereign God who directs all of history to accomplish his purposes is working individuals to t come to him in faith. And that's why Luke tells us in chapter 13 and verse 48 that as many were appointed to eternal life believed. It's why he tells us in 1614 that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. It's why God told Paul to evangelize fearlessly in Acts 18.10, for I have many in this city who are my people. So that moment when it hits you, I thought all along I was the one that had been seeking after God. I thought all along I was the one exercising faith. I thought all along that I was the one who understood my sin. I thought all along that I was the one reaching out for God. And then the Bible has to come in and, and let us in on a secret. That by grace you have been saved through faith. And even that faith is a gift. And it is the grace of God that anyone ever turns from their sins and comes to him. It's the grace of God, it's a sovereign act of God that anyone ever comes from darkness into light. And when we realize that, God's grace is given for God's glory. We're humbled. Or we should be humbled. 1 Corinthians 1 Verses 27 to 29 puts it this way. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. 
God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So here's a picture that, that, that God and the, through the Bible paints for us. When we're, when we're somehow gathered before God's throne in the eternal state, we're not going to be able to look at each other and say, yeah, we're the ones that got it. God looked and saw, those people are trying hard. I'm going to give them a boost. <laughs> we're going to look at each other and say, so you must be one of the low. You must want, have been one of the people who wasn't very powerful by worldly standards. You and I must have been those people who weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer by earthly standards. And we're going to stand there astonished that we're there because we realize that it is an act of God that we are here. And God does it that way because he deserves all the glory. And oftentimes we want him to have most of it. If I could just have this little piece. <laughs> but there's no room for boasting. It's excluded, Romans chapter 3. And no human be being should boast in the presence of God. So let me close this way this morning. Some of us here this morning are living on borrowed air. You have been content to receive God's blessings for the entirety of your life, but to reject the God who gave them to you that you and I know exists. And God is showing you an uncommon grace this morning in the fact that the gospel is being clearly preached. And so the call for you is simple. To turn away from all these vain things that you have been filling your life with and to turn in repentance and faith to a living God. God did not create you so that you can fulfill your own destiny. He created you to bring Him glory. And you know what? When you live for God's glory, you actually find the most joy. Living for God's glory does not find itself in opposition to joy. It's, it's not a choice of, well, I can't be happy because I've got to live for God's glory. It is the source of greatest happiness because God created you to bring Him glory. And if you are living according to His created purpose, and if you have been redeemed from your sins and have turned away from these empty, vain things, you will find joy. You have to believe that by faith. But for those of us who are followers, followers of Jesus, we need the good news too, don't we? We need that gospel preached to us again and again and again because we are tempted every day to be drawn away from the cross by all these vain things. All these vain things that we pursue and we look at to give us ultimate satisfaction and ultimate pleasure and ultimate safety and all of the ultimate things that those things can't give us. Money's helpful. If your car breaks down, it helps to be able to fix it. Family is a great gift. All of these things are good gifts, but we constantly turn away from seeing them simply as good gifts from God to ultimate things that we use to keep us safe and to keep us happy and to, and to, to keep us satisfied. And that's why Isaac Watts, 300 years ago, said, Forbid it, Lord, 
Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast except in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. God's grace is given for God's glory. And so this morning we give him much glory when we exalt we rejoice in the fact that we are undeserving recipients of that grace and we as a church body once again turn away from those vain things to a true and living God. So let's do that together in prayer right now and then let's sing that together after we pray.